All right, I want to thank you all again for being here. And I want to share with you a little more information about what your support to Gray Matters means. Gray Matters at Columbia supports fellowships in the Department of Psychiatry. Now, fellows are promising young physician scientists, newly minted MDs and PhDs. Gray Matters supports them as they pursue their work on the underpinnings of brain disorders. We nurture these young investigators early in their careers and provide them with an opportunity to pursue the most promising areas of science under the mentorship of the extraordinary senior faculty in the Department of Psychiatry. And believe me, these people live on so little money, you would be shocked. So the little bit of help that we give them by uh, supporting Gray Matters is enormously important. You're helping to attract the very brightest minds in science and medicine to foster a spirit of collaboration and inquiry, to engage in pioneering research, and to translate the results of that research into better and more effective interventions, not just for those under the care of our doctors, but for all patients faced with psychiatric diagnoses. In a time of economic challenges and dwindling resources for medical investigation, your support is more important than ever before. You're helping those today who are facing obstacles like addiction, learning disorders, anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, and autism, as well as those who love and care for them and those who will face those same obstacles tomorrow. You're providing hope for those for whom the outlook has sometimes seemed hopeless and helping us remove the stigma that too often comes with a diagnosis. This kind of ambitious undertaking requires visionary leadership, so I am especially pleased to make this next introduction. Dr. Jeffrey A. Lieberman is the chair of the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia and is a world-renowned expert in schizophrenia and psychosis. He also serves as director of the New York State Psychiatric Institute. He is also as so many of us in this room know firsthand, a great friend, a compassionate physician, an outstanding leader, and a very public voice for some of the most vulnerable among us who too often do not get the attention they deserve or the help that they need. Earlier this year, as many of you know, he published a remarkable book called Shrinks, The Untold Story of Psychiatry on the History of His Profession. Just in case you wonder whether I actually read it, you can see I've got all my tags here. <laughs> Reviewers, and I was the first one to write a review on Amazon, just so you know. I called Rosemary and I said, people have to write on Amazon. Anyway, reviewers have called it authoritative, scientifically scintillating, and anecdotally dazzling. That wasn't me, somebody else wrote that. And it was an editor's choice of the New York Times book review. If you haven't read it already, obviously I recommend it highly. And I have to tell you, anybody that has been a friend of Jeffrey will enjoy this book. First of all, there are admissions in here about the, the early mistakes of psychiatry, and they went on for hundreds and hundreds of years. And then the turning point, and what Freud was really like, and psychopharmacology, and there's just so much information in here about PTSD. Whatever the issue that might be among your friends and family, you're gonna find some of the help you want in this story, and also some of the background. But also, let me tell you, there's wonderful stories in here. I lived on the same block with Jeffrey and uh, Rosemary long ago when our children were little, and so I'm reading in this book about the time he had to take the air conditioner out of the window because it was getting to be uh, winter, and he dropped it 15 stories down on 86th Street. Oh my God, he didn't kill anybody, thank God. Talk about anxiety, the guy knows what he's talking about. Anyway, lots of wonderful personal stories in here that tell you a little bit about where his compassion and his empathy comes from. So uh, I just want to ask you to direct your attention to one of the screens around the room for a brief video that will tell us all a little bit more about the extraordinary work of Dr. Lieberman and his colleagues. What's different about Columbia psychiatry is the richness of the intellectual resources here. The excitement and enthusiasm directed toward finding better treatments is much more aligned than ever before. 
This is a, probably the only place in the world to have extraordinarily strong biological psychiatry with representation in many different areas. But you also have an academically based analytic institute that is very rare. And the combination is unheard of. Columbia fosters the type of scientific innovation that will allow us to ultimately be able to tailor treatments for patients, resulting in a meaningful impact in their lives. To get well requires the best faculty, but you also need to deliver care in a compassionate way, in which people feel comfortable, they feel welcomed, and they feel supported. So Columbia is a powerhouse for research, for psychotherapy, for clinical experiences. It really has the entire package. Columbia Psychiatry's programs in education are very tightly integrated with the other two very important missions of the department, which are excellence in research and excellence in clinical services. Whatever treatment someone may need, it can be found here. This is the place to come, and I am so proud to be part of the Columbia Psychiatry family. Due to support that we receive from a variety of sources, including the federal government, the state government, and generous individuals who contribute to our mission philanthropically, our talented faculty, trainees, and providers are able to reduce the burden of mental illness and patients in need, and also generate new knowledge, which will lead to better improvement and ultimately cures for people in the future. So. It is now my great pleasure to welcome to the stage the Chair of Psychiatry at Columbia, Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman. Wait, 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 wait a minute, Don. I don't want you to run away so fast. Uh, first of all, a disclaimer, um, the stories in the book, none of you are in, in the book. And, and if you are, if you recognize yourself, you've been anonymized. <laughs> so, uh, so don't worry. But um, I just wanted to say that um, this is uh, an amazing event that we've been now doing for eight years, and um, Donna has been hosting it and uh, ac acting as the sort of mistress of ceremonies throughout, and has been with us when we were just a little bitty, tiny thing. You know, the inspiration came from the Mowinian family. We went to the Rainbow Room for the first year. We raised thirty-five thousand dollars, and. We're now in our eighth year, and we're sort of on the verge of raising $600,000 from this luncheon event. <clears throat> and, and it's an event that is subscribed to, the room is packed, and people enjoy as opposed to feel like I've got to sit through this. And it's just become something which has become just not just a source of support, but a source of enjoyment and a way of communicating and making relationships with people. And um, I've, I've recently sort of gotten into social media. Uh, and this is my Twitter handle, so I want you to know that during the, during, during the program, I'm going to be tweeting out things and so forth. So uh, if, you're, uh, if you're on Twitter, uh, look out for that. Um, but also, you know, sort of getting into the swing of things, uh, this is such a... Isn't this a beautiful scene? I want to do a selfie. Okay, so, um, and everybody smile. You know, um, these events uh, are, e you know, people think that they're sort of easy to organize, and, and they may be to some degree when you initially uh, convene such an activity, but, can you take my picture? <laughs> the, the trick is getting people to come back, and for eight years, we've, I think, been enormously successful in getting people to come back, not because they feel obligated or because Rosemary or Teresa Mojada or Laurie Rosenfeld is twisting their arms. It's because they enjoy it and they want to come back and they believe in, 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 in the cause. Um, and we have people who have been coming here for 
many years, and we also have new people each year. Um, how many people have been here before? That looks like the majority. How many people, this is the first time? Okay, so we're taking attendance, and if you're not back next year, you'll be getting, you'll be getting a call from somebody. Um, but the, the success of this is like, you know, I, I get some of the credit and uh, all of the money, but um, the reality is, is that this is done by a core group of committed individuals, a Gray Matters committee which organizes this thing. They take a week off after this and then they get to work for next year. Um, and they're doing this because they believe in the cause of mental illness research and treatment and the fact that the funds that we raise go to support the best intellectual talent that exists in all of medicine and biomedical research in the country. Um, and uh, we have individuals that really support it and really take leadership roles. And I, I would like to just recognize the sponsors for this, were, this year's event, which include Bettina and Leonardo Farkas, uh, Pat and uh, Bill Ramonis, uh, Mitch Kofluck and Rob Sobel from the Sally Foundation, and then our corporate sponsors, Synovian uh, and uh, Spycare. Jonathan, what is that? So, so this is the, the, the chief medical director for this is one of our graduates. So he really leaned on the corporation to contribute to this. <laughs> now, I have to make this pitch because uh, Regina, uh, our development officer, and Kristen Mahood sort of made me. So we're extremely grateful to all our supporters for their loyalty, commitment, friendship, and wish you to. And if you wish to make an additional contribution, there is a card that you can flip over. Your, if you flip over your place card, you'll find a contribution card. And please search your soul and be as generous as possible. And if you've completed the card, you can place it in the box in the middle of the table or give it to one of the volunteers who will be coming around at the end of the luncheon. This has been a paid political announcement, which I approve. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but as you know, our supporters and uh, all of you have given to support our efforts and our mission. I think that we've also, you know, delivered in terms of owning up uh, on our end of the bargain. Um, we have been for the past eight years the number one ranked department in the country based on just NIH funding, and uh, that's an extraordinary record. And uh, in terms of the reputational ratings of healthcare services in the new US News and World Report, um, we rank this year number two. So I think what this reflects is that in supporting the cause is important, mental illness, brain research, mental health care. But supporting Columbia Psychiatry is you know, putting your money into the best hope for humanity to make the fastest progress in this area. And you know, that's what this is all about, is just basically identifying the best and the brightest and enabling them to transition from their training to the careers that they'll spend the rest of their lives doing, which in this case is studying the cause and developing the treatments for mental illness um, and providing care. Now, it's interesting, um, I learned somewhere along the way in my 30-year academic career, why do people go on boards of healthcare institutions particularly? And they may believe in the cause, they may have an interest in science, but it's mainly that they can get good care when they get sick. Um, and you want to know when you get sick that you've got the most competent person taking care of you. Because the reality is, is there's good doctors and there's less good doctors, but in psychiatry, the field is even more variable for reasons that I won't go into but are described in my book if you have any interest. Um, and what we provide is really the premium brand in healthcare because we have smart people and we also have the ability to take the research and translate it into care as soon as it's ready for prime time. And as Donna mentioned, and recent years I've been drawn into commenting in the public arena 
about issues pertaining to mental illness and mental health care, and uh, did so in uh, the aftermath of Robin Williams' tragic suicide, which, in my opinion, was not wholly, at least uh, significantly preventable. And it really was captured in, in, in uh, Kay Jamison, who's a dear friend and colleague at Johns Hopkins, uh, op-ed piece um, where she talked about his death. And she said, you know, depression and substance abuse and mental disorders are hard to treat and challenging and have risks, but it's all about competent care. Are you getting competent care? And the bad rap that mental health care gets is because evidence-based treatments are not being properly administered or financed. And what we try and do is raise the bar with respect. So I want you to know that um, this is our sort of uh, commitment and mission. Now, we have in the audience at some of your tables people who are trainees, faculty. I would like you to stand up for a minute. Please stand, all Columbia trainees, faculty. I, 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 I cannot tell you how extraordinarily talented, dedicated these people are. And every day I wake up thinking, how am I going to get money to feed these hungry mouths? You know, that's basically my job. Uh, it's not what I train for, but it's, it's, it's what I do. But at the same time, I want you to know that our commitment to you is that we are here for you. You have a problem, we are here for you. And if you have it, we can't, we can't find the cures to everything, but we will be able to provide the best that is currently available in the field of psychiatric medicine. Now, <clears throat> the crisis that Don alluded to is basically a governmental crisis. I wish Matilda, uh, which her late husband had run for president and uh, had been able to solve these things, but um, the, the, the reality is, is that because of the way our country finances biomedical research and healthcare, um, we're in dire straits. And if it wasn't for philanthropic support, I don't know where academic medicine would be. Uh, but what it's shown in this crisis is that individuals sort of step into the breach and vote with their feet. And we have seen, I have seen over the past decade that I've been chair, how individuals have made a difference in the conditions that we're trying to improve. Um, we have people like Dana Buckman and her foundation that have developed, no, 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 applause, no applause, no applause, please, um, who have dedicated themselves to developing a promise project for learning disabilities. Uh, Mitch Kuflick and Rob Sobel, who have supported through the Sally Foundation uh, efforts to raise awareness and conduct research in uh, suicide. Uh, Laura Slatkin and Allison Singer, who have uh, raised enormous funds that we've benefited from for autism. Um, of course, the Liebers for schizophrenia. Jennifer Monsky, who has worked tirelessly to support our program, an unusual program for the CNS complications of Lyme disease. Um, Anna Chapman, who came to us with an idea that we hadn't really thought about, which is providing mental health care services for the victims of domestic violence. Um, Audrey Gruss, who has started a foundation in honor of her late mother for depression and has brought in uh, leading scientists working at the kind of cutting edge of neuroscience. Bridget Rock, who has really focused attention on the not importance only of addiction and drug abuse, but particularly on the effects on youth, particularly because of what's happening in the country with the legalization or liberalization of access to marijuana. Um, and the Milheiser family, Tim and Ginny, who have supported research in neuropsychiatric conditions affecting speech, like stuttering. And I just want to pay kind of special tribute to uh, one amazingly uh, philanthropic example of an individual making a difference. Uh, Leonardo Farkas, who's here with his wife Bettina, is from Chile, and um, he has 
demonstrated sort of an ability to show how civic-minded individuals can respond to national crises and social needs heroically. So you remember when the Chilean miners were stranded for those 90 days, what was it, 90? 67 days. Uh, he was there when they emerged and provided them with financial support so they could get back on their feet in a home if they didn't have one. And then recently, when there were mudslides in Chile, before the government responded, he was there to provide aid for the people who lost their homes or suffered as a consequence of it. It shows you how individuals are able to step into the breach where the government is not and provide support that makes all the difference. Now, um, we also have as a member of our group of, of uh, uh, collaborators and supporters, uh, uh, the Ramonas family, Bill and Pat Ramonas, and they did something which was quite unique. They not only contributed some money, they contributed their daughter-in-law. And so <laughs> their daughter-in-law has been sort of, uh, you know, inveigled to come here from uh, Minneapolis, and you'll be hearing from here shortly. Um, so this year's theme, we have a theme each year. This year's theme is addiction, substance use disorders, uh, and we have uh, two speakers who are really just extraordinarily knowledgeable about this and also uh, scintillating personalities that I think you'll enjoy. But before uh, I introduce the first of these, I just want to recognize somebody else. So addiction and substance abuse was totally neglected by the medical profession. It was a moral failing, not an illness. And faith-based approaches to treating it arose in the absence of any medical attention. Um, that changed, fortunately, some years ago. And the person who really probably played the pivotal role in fostering biomedical research and addiction is one of our distinguished faculty, Herb Kleber. Herb, where are you? Can you stand? Herb, can you stand up, please? Her, Herb is literally the, uh, the, the parent of addiction research in this country. He began uh, as the drug czar under the Nixon administration and then migrated back out of government to academia. And he fostered a career that has now produced a, uh, a legion of researchers in this area. Um, and it's appropriate that we have as our guest speaker today, uh, Nora Volkow, who in that sense is, is really one of his progeny. Because Nora, who was um, Russian by descent and raised in Mexico and went to medical school there, came to the United States to train in psychiatry. And, uh, you know, it was all timing or luck, but she was training in psychiatry at NYU at the dawn of the neuroimaging neuroscience revolution. And the new technology was PET scanning, positron emission technology, or tomography. And she trekked from NYU out to uh, Long Island to Brookhaven, where they had the first PET scanner, uh, to basically learn the trade, learn the technology, and became a world-class pet researcher and neuroscientist. And uh, just as, as uh, uh, Herb really established addiction research as a legitimate scientific area, Nora was the person who used the tools of neuroscience to basically say addiction is a brain disease and to show that you may start out normal, uh, anxious, depressed, you know, a little bit uh, uh, you know, mischievous and risk-taking and reckless. However, and you stumble into it, but once you get into it, the substance of abuse changes your brain. And so even though you innocently enough began to experiment, you begin to descend down the slippery slope from which neuro neurobiologically, not that there's no return, but it's, it's a tough road to return from. And she really put this on the map. And <laughs> in the tradition of no good deed goes unpunished, um, she was rewarded for this work by being selected as the, national, the, the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse 
and having to deal with the Congress and the administration. Uh, but she does so with uh, great intelligence and, 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 and eloquence, and I, I, I think you'll really enjoy hearing from her today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Nora Volkow. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Actually, it's also a, a honor, and I want to thank um, Jeff for having given me this opportunity to come and discuss uh, the science of addiction. I also want to thank him for the leadership he has taken in bringing forward the recognition of addiction as a disease that's part of mental illnesses. So if we are struggling constantly about the notion of mental illness being um, forgotten and not taking the care that they deserve, uh, of all of them, perhaps the one that's uh, worst treated is addiction. And despite all of the evidence that exists in science, it is still a highly stigmatized disorder that is considered basically by many still a disorder that is not a disorder, but that reflects a choice of people taking drugs. And as a medical student, of course, I was exposed to this perspective on addiction. It was very difficult to me to try to understand this, also as a psychiatrist, that someone would basically be willing to uh, su suffer all of the devastating consequences that are associated with uh, becoming an addicted drug just for the mere pleasure, for the choice of getting that rewarding effects from taking the drug. And my brain hurts me when something doesn't make sense. So my brain was hurting me because I sort of, <laughs> was saying, could I imagine a pleasure that would be so extraordinary, so extraordinary, that I would be willing to give everything I care for, my family, my work, uh, money, just for the temporal gratification of that sensation, and, and I just couldn't comprehend of such a pleasure. And that's what uh, drove me on to try to understand exactly why is it, first of all, that we become addicted to drugs and why a person that's addicted to drugs lose the capacity to control their own desires and behaviors. And, and this, was, this was obsessing me because if you think about what is it that makes us humans, what is one of the things that we value the most? Our capacity to make an assessment, a judgment, and then do the behaviors to carry out our decision. That's what freedom is all about. Yet, in the person that becomes addicted, that ability to make a decision and transfer it into an action gets disrupted. And that, of course, explains why the consequences are so devastating. So what has science told us? Using brain imaging, for example, it has provided us the evidence that clearly shows that addiction is a disease of the brain. What you see in these images are the same technology applied for someone comparing a person that's normal versus someone that had a myocardial infarct. Those are the images on the low, low side. And what it shows is the area where the myocardium no longer is functioning. Using the same methodology, you can actually, but instead of imaging the, the heart, you can image the brain. And you can actually specify what areas of the brain are not functioning in a person that's addicted to drugs. So whereas the heart has always been recognized if you have a myocardial infarction that you have an addiction, because it's simple to understand, the heart is a muscle. So if it doesn't contract, you don't actually deliver blood. But the brain is an extraordinary complex organ. And our understanding about how it works is just starting to emerge. And so for this, in this case, for example, what these imaging studies are showing us is that this area of the brain, the frontal cortex, the lower parts of our frontal cortex, that actually allows us to do behaviors as a function of the value of the reward. So right now, I found the food was fantastic, Jeff, fantastic food. I ate it, it was very rewarding to my brain, I was starving. But if you put that food right now in front of me, I'm going to ignore it. Why? Because this area of my brain had said, this is no longer salient, and instead, I can pay attention so I can do, give this presentation. Well, this area of the brain that allows me to shift my priorities from when I'm hungry and eating it to something else when that no longer makes sense is what is damaged in people that are addicted to drugs. 
and that's what you see in this image. Unfortunately, it's not the only brain area that is affected by the effects of drugs, which also explains why people that are addicted to drugs have a disruption of so many behaviors and how the, why their life gets so disrupted by this disease of the brain. We know that people take drugs and we all take drugs, alcohol is a drug, because they have a common capacity, whether it is legal or illegal, it doesn't matter. They all release dopamine in the main reward center of the brain, activating it. But this activation, this wiring of the brain to actually activate the reward systems by dopamine, by releasing dopamine, evolve over millions and millions of years of evolution. And it's the way that nature ensures that we do things that are important for survival. So food is rewarding because by so doing, it releases dopamine that then motivates our actions to, in the future, recognize that the food is rewarding and make us want it and motivate us to go and search and get the food that we need for survival. And drugs basically hijack that system. But they hijack it in a way that's much more potent than any natural reward. So what is the message that the brain is doing chemically? It's activating the reward system, which has evolved over millions of years of evolution, and that is perceived as extraordinary salient, a signal that is activated in order to ensure that behaviors that are important for survival. And in those individuals who are vulnerable, unfortunately, this ultimately results in the transformations in the brain that will lead him or her to lose control over their actions. And one of the areas of, of science that just has basically erupted is our understanding, our categorization about what are the changes that are produced in the brain by the repeated administration of drugs. And one of the things is that, yes, all of the drugs of abuse increase dopamine, but with repeated administration, the brain readapts itself in such a way that the signaling, the normal signaling of these pathways becomes impaired in, in such a way that the individual, in order to have a normal perception of everyday reality, requires the use of the drug to temporarily feel better. And with imaging technologies, for example, and this was actually quite sobering to my brain, it's sort of one of those things that I still have difficulty comprehending. Addiction is devastating, the loss of control. And yet, identifying one protein, one single protein, a receptor, a dopamine D2 receptor, that when you give repeated administration goes down, can actually facilitate bringing down that receptor by repeated administration of drugs makes you vulnerable for compulsive patterns of behavior. One protein. Why? Because it acts as a break, opposing a system that tells you go, go, go. This D2 receptor signaling controls it. So it was very sobering to me because as we are speaking about interventions that relate to how the science can help us identify potential targets, this type of knowledge, for example, highlights how valuable it would be to be able to do interventions that can increase the levels of these dopamine D2 receptors. And as science never, science never stops, it actually, what it's doing um, with access right now to technologies that are very powerful, it has allowed us for the first time in the whole psychiatry, including drug addiction, to try to inquire this very important question about why. Why are social systems so important in mental illness? Why is it that social stressors during childhood make me much more vulnerable to mental illness, including addiction? What do these social stressors do to the brain when it's developing in such a way that they make you vulnerable? So now with technologies, we can actually start to investigate that. And for example, we now know, among other things, that socially stressful environments, just like drugs, bring down those dopamine D2 receptors that make you vulnerable for impulsivity and compulsivity. 
And this is just the beginning of our understanding at the openness and the dynamic neuroplasticity, neuroplastic nature of our brains as it changes and it's transformed by our everyday experiences. And this is just illustrating how by doing these studies, we can, uh, in the laboratory, use animal models where we can actually isolate them and stress them and then see how that stress leads to the, how it affects the expression of these receptors that are very, very important in either protecting you against taking drugs by providing a stronger break or making you more vulnerable by making you much more impulsive and compulsive in the way that you respond to the environment. But I want to end my presentation with two things. As we gain knowledge, we sort of says we have a responsibility to use that knowledge in ways that can improve the quality of life of others. And in the case of mental illness, those individuals suffering from mental illness are probably some of the most vulnerable individuals of all of the diseases that we know of. And of those that are vulnerable, again, in mental illness, mental illness by itself is associated with a much greater vulnerability for the use of drugs and for the transition into addiction. But this is not inevitable. Drug addiction can be prevented. You need drugs in order to produce the plastic changes in the brain, whether you have the genetic vulnerability that makes you more likely to become addicted or not. You require the drugs. And preventing exposure to drugs, which are occurring much more frequently among teenagers and young adults, is probably the most efficacious intervention that we can do to prevent substance use disorders and also to improve the outcomes of individuals with mental illness in whom the outcomes are going to be much worse if they start taking drugs. And this is illustrated here, very simple graph that I'm showing you. It's um, a survey that we do. We survey 45,000 kids, uh, high school students throughout the United States, and we ask them two, two questions. How, what, whether they take drugs or not, and in this case, marijuana. But we also ask them, in this case, their perceive, uh, whether they perceive marijuana use as risky. And what you see in blue is the number of kids that perceive the use of marijuana as risky, counterbalanced to the prevalence rates of marijuana use among teenagers in our country as assessed by their exposure of marijuana in the past year. And what you can see is the mirror image of one another. The greater the number of kids perceiving marijuana as risky, the lower the number of kids that are going to be consuming marijuana. So yes, messages that are salient to adolescents can make a big difference in terms of their willingness to experiment to drugs and then to actually do this in a regular fashion. So prevention interventions, again, are one of the most powerful things that we can do in substance use disorder. But I also want my second message is substance use disorders can be treated. And this actually illustrates this in terms of not just only being able to show that an individual that actually, in this case, a person addicted to methamphetamine, was able to stay clean of any drugs for 18 months but they also, you can start to see that this was associated with that recovery of their brain dopamine systems. The evidence shows it. Substance use disorder is a disease of the brain. It's a chronic disease. And so if we are going to tackle this issue about substance use disorders can be treated, we need to recognize that they have to be treated like a chronic disease. That the model that we have used all of these years have a little bit of a wishful thinking. Okay, you go into a treatment program one month, you are going to be cured. Actually, it does not work. It's the equivalent of someone that has hypertension to say, okay, I'm going to give you one month of medication of antihypertensive, and that's it, and release them. That's the way that we've been addressing substance use disorders. It's a chronic disease that is devastating. And so when my brain hurts me and says, can I understand why someone would be willing to forego everything they care for from the drug? The answer is no. You cannot understand it that way. 
And, and I always ask my, my patients because I think that there is an incredible privilege to be able to have a dialogue with those that are suffering this disease to try to understand their own experience. And one of the things that they commonly say to me and says, Doc, you know, I don't understand why I'm even taking the drug because it's no longer pleasurable. It's not even pleasurable. Yet, I cannot stop it. So when I say people, which is constantly still an issue of debate, that addiction is not a medical illness, by describing it as a medical illness, you are removing the responsibility. I would like to ask us to them, basically, do they have an answer of what it means to be able to not take a drug and yet not be able to stop not doing it? Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Volko. That was fantastic. We appreciate you joining us today and for all the good work that you have done and are doing. Before we conclude today, I do want to acknowledge that we have with us uh, Betsy Gottbaum, who's our former public advocate of the city of New York. And I also want to call to your attention the fact that my friend Karen Colster and I, who knew Rosemary and Jeffrey long ago when our kids were this high, we both noticed that he didn't give us any details about the dropping of that air conditioner. <laughs> so you'll just have to come back next year. <laughs> anyway, do take a look on the inside of your, of your name tag there. There's an opportunity to give more. If you possibly can, this would be the act of an angel. So please take a look and consider doing that and putting it in the little box on your table. And I will see you next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>